morning, and thank you for joining us for tonight's candidate forum for Legislative Districts 20 and 21. I'm Julie Erfley, a communications consultant at Erfley Uncuffed and columnist at the Arizona Mirror. And I am pleased to serve as the moderator of this legislative, legislative candidate forum for education, co-sponsored by two local nonpartisan 501c3s, the Arizona Center for Economic Progress and Save Our Schools Arizona Network. These organizations are collaborating to provide voters with objective and factual information about key public education issues so they can make informed decisions this election cycle. We will begin by allowing each candidate up to two minutes to introduce themselves and their education platform. For the sake of equal treatment and ample time for Q&A, we will be keeping time and asking candidates to conclude their remarks immediately once their time limit is reached. There will be a clock visible for candidates and audience members so you will know when to stop. Once registrations are complete, I will ask four questions that were contributed in advance by registered audience members. Each candidate will have one opportunity to answer each question in under two minutes. If another candidate's answer directly references you, I, the moderator, may choose to allow one minute for a response if time allows. At the end of the forum, I will ask each candidate to deliver closing remarks of no longer than one minute and we will conclude the forum. I encourage the candidates to share their websites and social media handles during this time so that voters may continue to learn more about your positions. With that, we will begin our discussions. I'm going to allow candidates their two minute opening statements using alphabetical order. Unfortunately, a number of candidates asking for your vote chose not to participate tonight. But we will hear from Doug Irvin, Kathy Connect, and Judy Schwiebert. Thank you for joining us. Let's start with our opening statement from Doug Irvin. Well, thank you very much for everybody for working so hard to put this event together and allow us a little bit of time to talk to the voters in our districts about the importance of education. So my name is Doug Irvin. I'm running for state senator here in LD20. And I've lived in Arizona since I was three years old. That's right after my father left the Air Force. He was a Air Force captain and my mom was a teacher of nursing. And they instilled in me some really important Arizona values, such as hard work, integrity, and community service. But mostly they said, education is absolutely critical to you. And they also said, we're gonna be very honest with you. We have a large family. So by the time we get to you, the college fund will be gone. So I started working at the age of 13 in the restaurant business, and I ended up putting myself through night school working full-time during the day. And that's where I got my accounting degree. And so I became a controller for a small business. I was a corporate tax auditor. And then I got into the software industry where I spent decades consulting with businesses and designing software for financial systems, where I really learned a lot about local small mom and pop businesses and was able to work with large international companies all over the world. And then I was lucky a few years ago, I had the chance to retire and really go back to that other thing that my folks taught me, community service. So I started um, volunteering for many organizations related to the environment, uh, community emergency response team, and especially in the education front. Where even to this day, I'm a volunteer tutor for second graders, which is just a wonderful experience. But then I kept seeing teachers having to bring in more and more of their own supplies, students getting in more and more in a classroom, so I went down to the legislature and said, why, why is this happening? And what I found out was just a bunch of people who were supposedly representing me did not want to talk to me. And then I started going to budget meetings because I have to tell you as an accountant, to me, that was like going to Disneyland. I was going to see the experts in the world talk about tax policy, but that's not what happened. So thank you very much for being here. I really appreciate it. So thank you. Thank you, Doug. Up next, we'll hear from Kathy Connect. Oh, Kathy, I think you're muted. <laughs> That's never happened to me before. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry about that. I want to thank SOS and thank you to the center for having us here tonight. I am Kathy Connect and I'm running for the Arizona House because I want to represent all the people here in LD21 in the Northwest Valley. 
Uh, I'm a West Valley girl. I, I was an elementary school teacher here. Uh, I was a 12 year public school board member in Peoria and I was the president of the Arizona School Boards Association. I ran Leadership West, which is a regional nonprofit development corporation. And I am really dedicated to serving our local community and growing a strong local economy. I've dedicated my life to public service like Doug and have served on dozens of nonprofit boards addressing economic development, the arts, senior issues and domestic violence. I was an honorary commander at Luke Air Force Base and now I volunteer there regularly as a member of the Blue Blazer Squadron. I've always been an independent thinker and a pragmatic bipartisan leader and I'm focused on strengthening our schools, ending the teacher crisis, creating safe and effective learning environments and also ensuring our seniors and families have affordable quality health care and bringing down the cost of prescription drugs. And I want to bring high paying jobs to Arizona and the Northwest Valley. And we know to do that, to attract those businesses, we need to invest in pre-K through, uh, through 12th grade and higher education. And that's what I want to do. For me, leadership is about service and doing the right thing. And the challenges that our state is facing right now are too great to waste time on partisan bickering and fringe issues. We have to get past this idea that if one side wins, then the other side has to lose. The all or nothing mentality is what's divided our neighborhoods and it's preventing us from finding solutions for everyone. All or nothing is not how I work. Uh, I like to stay focused on common sense solutions and finding common ground. I know that the government works best when everyone has a seat at the table and a balanced government, unlike the one we've had for too long in Arizona, creates better conversations, better budgets, and better outcomes for the people here in Arizona. Thank you, Kathy. Up next, we'll hear from Judy Schwiebert. Thank you so much, Julie, and thank you to Save Our Schools Arizona and the Arizona Center for Economic Progress for co-sponsoring this event and everybody for uh, watching tonight. So my name is Judy Schwiebert and I am a candidate for the Arizona State House in Legislative District 20. Um, this is where I have spent my life. Uh, I raised my sons who are now both grown in this community. They attended wonderful Washington Elementary District schools and Greenway High School. And I was a teacher myself for 27 years at Greenway and Cactus High Schools. And I guess you could say that education is in my blood. Um, my dad supported our family of five as I was growing up here in Phoenix uh, on his salary as a shop teacher at Carl Hayden High School. And he and my mom taught us the importance of hard work, perseverance, respect, and most of all, the value of education. So I became a teacher as well and loved doing the work that I did even after I became a single mom and I could still be able to put food on the table for my family. But more recently after I retired, I was uh, volunteering with a master second grade teacher who uh, I was horrified to learn had to work four jobs to make ends meet. Finally, um, she left the state like so many other teachers have done in recent years uh, for a much higher paying teaching job elsewhere. You know, our legislature's failure to adequately fund our schools has just resulted in a severe teacher shortage crisis. Um, so I never imagined that I would actually be running for office, but as a grandmother and mother and teacher, it just breaks my heart that last year alone, we had children in over 1,800 classrooms who had no permanent qualified teacher. That's stunning. And now, of course, the pandemic threatens to make the teacher shortage crisis even worse. Thank you. Thank you, Judy. Up next, we will have the questions. These were submitted by registered participants prior to tonight's event. And for the sake of transparency for our viewers, please know that these questions were shared with all of the candidates ahead of time. Candidates, please stick to under two minutes. We will go in reverse alphabetical order for question number one and alternate the order for the remainder of the evening. Question number one, we'll start with Judy Schwiebert. What resources are needed to have excellent schools? And how will you make sure that every student's public school, especially those from disadvantaged communities, has those resources? Thank you, that's a great question. 
So first of all, we need to start by listening to teachers and administrators. They are the ones who know best what it is that they need for their students in their schools. But I wanna back up for a minute and just talk about the reason it's so important to have excellent schools for everybody. You know, I believe that we all do better when we make sure that every student gets the great education they deserve. It's not only the right thing to do, but a good education lifts people out of poverty, reduces crime, and fuels our economy. The pandemic has made at least two things very clear. First, it's the spending by everyday people like all of us that drives our economy and cre creates more jobs. And the best way to put money in people's pockets is to educate them so they can be a part of the strong educated workforce that our businesses are crying for. Second, it's also made clear the tremendous inequities in our schools. We need to recalculate the whole funding formula and think again about results-based funding. That model rewards mainly affluent schools but it's the underperforming schools in lower socioeconomic neighborhoods that need more investment and support. That's the way we can make sure that every student gets a great education and we're building an economy that works for everybody. Thank you, Judy. Same question for you, Kathy Connect. Oh, I'm sorry. Here. <laughs> um, Sorry about that. Um, so really there are three areas of funding that I would address uh, first off. Um, the first one was funding for our teachers. Uh, Judy mentioned the teacher crisis here in Arizona. And we know that a high performing teacher is the best return on an investment uh, when the goal is student achievement. The Arizona Progress Meter puts Arizona teachers as some of the lowest paid in the nation gives us a model. It shows um, that we can have this goal of a me the median salary for the year. I think that should be the first goal that uh, Arizona tries to, the first benchmark that Arizona tries to meet. That would help us be competitive with the other states, um, both for residents that we hope will locate here and for businesses that we want to attract. The second area is we need to make up for years of inadequate funding for repairs and maintenance on the school buildings that we, the taxpayers, own. Um, it's outlined in the Arizona Constitution that that's what we need to do. Uh, it's no different than your house. If, if you don't keep them maintained and upgraded along the way, the cost is so much more to fix it in the end. And failure to fund capital for over a decade has left some classes unsafe, and it's shifted the tax burden onto the local property taxpayers who pay for capital expenses with bonds, um, except in those communities that was mostly lower income communities that can't pass bonds. They just have to watch their, their neighborhood schools crumble, and then their property values go down with it. And then finally, on the equity piece, um, I agree with Judy, results-based funding has got to go. Uh, taxpayers want to know that their taxes are used where they're needed the most. Um, results-based funding puts money into high-achieving schools, schools that are already doing well, rather than, rather than in those communities with the greatest need. And I believe that when we raise up the lower performing schools, that all of Arizona will rise. Thank you, Kathy. And same question for you, Doug Urban. Yeah, there's a lot. And I agree with Kathy and Judy that we need to be listening to the superintendents and the teachers and the people on the ground saying exactly what do you need in each school? Because they're not all the same. But we know there are certain commonalities. One is we need to make sure there's more counselors for kids especially during these difficult times, because we are all feeling the stress. You can imagine how much an effect this is having on the students. So those counselors, we really need to lower those ratios because we're some of the worst in the nation in that. Also, this pandemic has really shown the importance of having computers, not just for the students, but that each student should have their own computer, but making sure the teachers have the technical support and the computers that they need. And there are tech support staff to handle those issues from there. Also, we just need to make sure the books are modern and things from that point. But of course, as an accountant and a tax guy, when I hear that we need things, 
I'm going to say, right, how do I get those for you? That's my good job in the legislature, is to know that we have the revenue and the sources to do that. So I'm really going to dig into the tax policy and make sure that we're correcting the myriad of really unproductive sales tax exemptions and credits that we have out there. And I'd love to talk about the tax policy things. And as Judy and Kathy know, I'll probably go for a couple hours on just that. So you'd be lucky there's a two minute stop gap on there. But there is revenue available out there and we'll talk more about that this evening, hopefully. But yes, we just need to make sure that the teachers have the ability to go back and teach again so that they're, they've got the resources they need. They really are inspired to do that. And they're also being able to keep track of their own family and that they can support their own family with a decent salary and income. All right, thank you, Doug. Question number two. This time we'll go back to alphabetical order. So we'll start with you, Doug. Schools at all levels are faced with significant new health and safety challenges due to the COVID-19 pandemic. How will you identify and advocate for the resources needed to ensure healthy and safe schools, as well as those resources necessary to deliver high quality education? Yeah, similar to like I was just talking about, uh, I'm going to listen to the experts out there. I, I'm not a health medical expert. I have some family members who are, or that's their bailiwick, and I'll listen to them, but also listening to the experts at the state that says, how do we keep our students healthy and safe during these difficult times? What steps do we need to take? Again, each district, each school is different. And how do we make sure that we keep the teachers safe and healthy? How do we keep the family and the community? because this is important overall to really get the economy going and so people have confidence to get back. So I wanna to listen to those experts. I'm thrilled that Superintendent Hoffman worked with experts and they developed those metrics so that the community can actually see the gains that they're doing because we all need to work together to get this done. But again, there are adjustments that are gonna to have to be made. There are expenses that are gonna come up that we never thought of before to make sure that the kids can be more socially distanced. So how are we going to get those revenue to the schools? How are we going to take the burden off of the, so the teachers don't have to worry? Because a lot of the teachers I've talked to, you said, you know what happened here? I not only had to be an expert in history or English or math or whatever it was, suddenly I have to be an IT expert now. And then I have to be able to set those things up. So we need to make sure that, again, that support is available for them so that they're able to do what they're very good at, which is teaching the students at every level along the way so that they've got the best they need and still being able to have that support staff that, hey, how do we keep these students healthy when the situations arise? So that's what I really wanna bring up during these situations and make sure that everybody has the revenue and the supplies they need. Thank you, Doug. Kathy, how do you ensure health and safety? Oh, health and safety. Um, well, first, let me say that these times are really tough on everybody right now. And uh, we know that parents are nervous and teachers are concerned and, and everybody's really trying to do their best and make the best decisions possible. So uh, I hope that people are treating each other with grace during this time. But the question was, how are we going to identify the needs? And that, that, that comes from looking at the data. Uh, and listening to the teachers, to the parents, and we can't forget, we have to listen to the students and hear about their concerns. And like Doug said, we have to listen to the health and safety experts. Um, we need to know what the concerns are within the school, at the home, and also in the broader community and watch what's happening out in the broader community. In the short term, I'd say that we need to advocate for some adaptations within the system like we need to reassess now what, what are the seat time requirements and are they, are they still legitimate during this time when we know that not all kids are actually sitting in their classroom five days a week. Uh, and we need to, like Doug said, we need to ensure that we have safe learning environments. I am sure that um, from now, from maybe the next year or so, there are going to be some urgent needs and some ongoing expenses that are associated with COVID-19. And now that so many of the schools are opening, you know, what, what we're hearing is now that they're open, they're desperate to stay open. And that's going to require more investments in a lot of things. It's going to require more investments, investments in uh, virtual learning tools 
and broadband, especially in the rural parts of our state. Uh, we need PPE, we need sanitizing tools, uh, we need barriers and distancing devices and air, air filtration. We're learning more and more that our schools need to be equipped with air filtration. And there's any number of uh, tools designed to mitigate the spread of the virus and we hope that they'll work. Long term, teachers, we need to invest in teachers. Thank you, Kathy. Judy? Yeah, thank you. You know, going third means that a lot of the territory has been covered already. So what Doug said and what Kathy said, yes, we need to listen to the experts and uh, make sure that we are providing the resources that our schools need to keep everybody safe, like the PPE and the, uh, the barriers and the sanitation um, materials and all of that. Um, I, I guess I'll just you know, speak from a personal standpoint, I'm a grandmother and I get it. I think I want my grandkids back in school like so many parents and grandparents do. We know that's the best place for our kids, that school provides kids with the structure and the socialization that they need to learn and to develop important relationships and to be able to thrive. Um, so this time of COVID has just been really challenging for all of us. It certainly deepened many people's appreciation for the job that teachers do every day. Uh, and now more than ever, as they are stepping up to uh, the technology experts on top of everything else, as, as Doug mentioned. You know, our family wrestles with all of this because we want to make sure that our kids and teachers and communities are safe and healthy. Um, so I will just finish by saying I agree with Kathy and Doug on so many of their points that uh, we need to make sure we're providing schools with the resources they need to keep all of our kids and staff safe. Thank you, Judy. Question number three. This time we'll start with Kathy. Uh, today, Arizona taxpayers subsidize private schools and private school tuition at a combined cost of about $400 million per year. What is position on private school tax credits, empowerment scholarship accounts, vouchers, and the emergence of micro schools, which all have the result of diverting public taxpayer dollars for private use. Kathy? Thank you, Julie. Well, in the last 10 years or so, the Arizona did a, what I think is kind of a backwards thing. During this time that they're defunding education in Arizona, leaving us near the bottom of per pupil funding. At the very same time, they're trying to essentially run three or four, and now with micro schools, five different delivery models at the same time. And so the result has been this climate of scarcity, which, which, it, which doesn't lead to healthy competition and improvement, um, which I think it could in a climate of abundance, but instead, it leads to fighting over way too few resources for way too many school models. Um, and and it, it, may, it makes schools like having to spend dollars on things like marketing instead of teacher salaries and laptops where it's really needed. And charter schools, are, they're struggling with the same lack of funding as districts. And, you know, I'm kind of talking about school choice in general, um, but I'm a fan of school choice. I was on the Peoria School Board when we launched a dozen specialized magnet programs in district schools, they offer a ton of choices. They're open to anyone and they offer arts and academics and clubs and sports and CTE. The ESA voucher programs that are in place right now are serving well the purposes to the special populations, the special needs kids, the kids of military, the foster kids, uh, and there's a couple more categories. Um, and we should continue to support that. But remember, in 2018, 67% of Arizonans said that they didn't want those voucher programs to be expanded. And it's because they recognize that it means less to the districts and the charters, the public schools that 95% of our Arizona kids use. And I think that mandate from the voters should be respected. Thank you, Kathy. Up next, we'll hear from Judy. Okay. Uh, thank you, Julie. So, um, as Kathy mentioned, um, the original uh, purpose of the Empowerment Scholarship account vouchers um, was, um, it was created exactly because our 
really underfunded schools didn't have the resources to address the needs of some families of children with um, special needs. So I want to make sure that we're prioritizing those families who really need those ESA funds um, without overburdening them with paperwork and accounting requirements. You know, we shouldn't be pitting families against one another. Exactly, again, as Kathy just said, um, you know, unfortunately, there's a climate of scarcity in our, in our state for education dollars, which is what fuels a lot of that feuding, I think. Um, I think, but I think that Arizona does do a great job of providing choices to families. Students can go to any district or charter school they want in their own district or in another district. And guess what? 95% of our students choose to attend a neighborhood district or charter school. Um, and I think that's why in 2018, again, as Kathy mentioned, that um, voters gave a resounding no to additional voucher expansion until we make sure we're investing in neighborhood public schools that families choose the vast majority of the time. So I agree with those voters. Right now, Arizona still ranks at the bottom of the nation in per pupil funding. And if we want every student to get a great education, we need to do a, a better job first of investing in our public schools. Thank you, Judy. Finally, we'll hear from Doug Urban. Well, I agree a lot with what Kathy and Judy have said, especially on the ESAs. We need to make sure that we are protecting the students with special needs and their families. And I'm, I'm saddened that they put a financial burden or a bookkeeping burden on them also. And it's also sad that the legislature has refused to give the Department of Education the funds they need to ma manage that program effectively and help those families. So that's something I really wanna make sure that we're supporting. But on the STO front, that's something I wanna talk about because I was really shocked when I dug into this program. And this is a tax credit program. Just for the viewers, this is not the same as the two or $400 tax credit that you give to your local school. This is a different set of programs that wealthy families and corporations can donate and get a dollar for dollar credit. And this started as a small program and the funds can only be used to send students to private schools. Now that program had an escalator built into it. So it got bigger and bigger and bigger. Currently over $150 million a year gets diverted so it can only be used by the small percentage of students who goes to private schools. The really sad part is it also has what's called a 10% admin fee. So currently that's $15 million a year that's taken away from education that's not helping any student in any school anywhere. It's just making a few folks very, very wealthy. So that needs to be corrected and corrected quickly. But also we can be using those existing funds to help students across the whole state whether it be early childhood education, after the bell programs, quality summer learning programs. So that's not just helping those few students who are in private schools. Thank you. Thanks, Doug. Question number four, and this is actually a two-part question. Do you support Proposition 208, Invest in Education, which would establish a 3.5% income tax surcharge on the wealthiest 1% of Arizonans, raising approximately $940 million annually to increase teacher and classroom staff salaries, reduce class sizes, and more than double state funding for career and technical education. And do you believe there is strong support in your areas considering the demographic makeup of the many registered voters in your district? And we'll start with you, Doug. Yeah, a, a lot of people have asked me this question because I spent a lot of time on the phones talking to people reaching out to voters. And they go, you're the accountant guy. Explain the numbers to me. What's the really effect it's going to have on small businesses? What's going to have the effect on my personal taxes? So the first question I usually ask them is, how much over $500,000 a year do you and your spouse make? And most people say not anywhere near $500,000 a year or $250,000 a year. And then I'm saying it's not going to affect you. But then I also reach out to small business owners because that's a big focus of me is supporting and encouraging small businesses. And that's what they hear the rhetoric. It's going to put small businesses out. 
And I talk to those small businesses owners and I say, how much profit is each of the owners making over $500,000 a year? And I get that same look back saying, we wouldn't be a, just a small business if we were making that kind of money. I mean, there are some businesses that it will affect. There's no doubt. There are individuals that are out there. And most of them that I talked to said, education is critical because the way our business is going to grow is we're going to have a quality educated workforce. That's what we're struggling to get. So we're happy to make that extra three and a half percent on the amount over $500,000. So that's what I'm talking about. So that's why I do support it. But I really wish it had been something that didn't have to be pushed to the voters. I wish the legislature had done this themselves. So I have to admit as an accountant, would I have written it a little differently? Sure, maybe, but someone had to stand up because for too long we've heard we need to fund schools and for too long the legislature has said they haven't. And continuing to put it on sales tax is not the way to do it, especially when we have a legislature that year after year after year gives more exemptions to sales tax to those special interest groups. So again, we're shrinking the base instead of having a broad base and low rates. So this is a, that's why I'm supporting 208 and I will vote for it this year. Thank you, Doug. Kathy Connect. Thank you, Julie. Um, I too will support uh, Proposition 208 um, because at the end of the day, Arizona's education system has just been desperately underfunded for more than a decade and the children in this state deserve better. Um, Improving our schools is good for our property values. It lowers our crime rates. It develops our workforce. It attracts businesses and residents. And we want those things. It, and it makes healthier communities. So it's, it's way past time that we invest more in our schools. And polls have told us two things. One, they said the ma vast majority of Arizonans, regardless of their political party, they want to better fund schools. And two, that the method that is outlined in 208 was agreeable to most of the people that, that were asked. And I, I, I too wish that the legislature had done its job and solved this problem, but they haven't. Uh, there's been, there have been bipartisan legislative attempts to increase funding for schools. There was proposing a slight increase to the sales tax. Uh, there was a mix of different revenue sources um, to, to be combined. But the legislature again and again failed to act. So the citizens had to take matters into their own hands again. And it's a shame that we have to ask thousands of parents and teachers and education advocates to gather signatures in the summer heat during a pandemic, just because the legislature won't fulfill its constitutional obligation to fund schools. Um, about my district, uh, the vast majority of people in my district, like Doug illustrated, will not be negatively affected by the Proposition 208. But look, every Arizonan will benefit from stronger schools. Um, the voters will get to decide, but whether it passes or not, I'm gonna go down to the state legislature and fully support P through 20 public education. Thank you, Kathy. Finally, we'll hear from Judy Schwebert. Thank you, Julie. Um, so I will once again echo what Doug and uh, Kathy said. Uh, absolutely, yes, I um, strongly support Prop 208. Um, we need dedicated ongoing investments in teachers um, to reduce class sizes, to make sure we have counselors, to make sure we have career and technical education that can't be diverted to other projects by the legislature as we've seen sometimes happen in the past. And yes, it is too bad that we have to do this by proposition on the ballot. Uh, I wish that the legislature had acted at any time over the last 12 years to better fund education, but we remain at the bottom of the nation. And, it, you know, it's a free market economy. And as we have seen, teachers are fleeing to places where they can make a living wage or, or more money, um, just even here in the state. So we need to be competitive in those salaries. Also, um, I just have to mention my dad here. He started out as a shop teacher, as I mentioned, but he wound up as principal of the first vocational high school in the Valley, the Area Vocational Center down on the Phoenix Union High School campus. And my whole childhood, he drilled into me the importance of the trades. We need plumbers, electricians, welders, carpenters, and other people 
Um, and, you know, I hear from the people I'm talking to all the time. I'm making phone calls every day, talking to lots and lots of people in our community. And they talk about, you know, what about these trades? We need people who are going to do this. And what about young people who are going to be ready to come, you know, into the workforce, ready to do a job? Uh, because for 12 years, we've been grossly underfunding our schools. And you know what? You get what you pay for. Too many of our students, unfortunately, aren't prepared. And it's not the fault of students. And it's not the fault of teachers. It's, it's the fault of those of us who have not taken responsibility to make sure that we are adequately funding our schools. Thank you, Judy. And thank all of you for your willingness to share very valuable information with all of us. Uh, at this time, each candidate has one minute to share his or her final remark. And this time we're going to start in reverse alphabetical order. So we will start with Judy Schwiebert. Okay. Thank you again so much uh, for this opportunity to talk about our views on education. Um, I just want to say it is time to elect leaders like Doug and Kathy and me who will put the everyday people of our communities first and not special interests as our current legislators have done for too long. I also urge everyone to vote yes on Prop 208 because it will go a long way toward creating and protecting that ongoing revenue stream that we need for our students and our future. We will all do better when we invest in a strong, educated workforce because educated people are the very foundation for rebuilding the strong economy we need. Please find out more about me at my website, judyforaz.com. Thank you, Judy. And finally, we'll hear from Kathy Connect. Thank you, uh, Julie and SOS and the Arizona Center for Economic Progress. I'm going to end on something that's not specifically related to education. Uh, all the good ideas that my colleagues and I have, and I admire them so much, and all the dreams for a brighter future, get nowhere if our communities don't stop fighting each other. We've let school issues and so many other issues become political and divisive, and it's a sad state of affairs, and it's a disservice to our kids on so many levels. I am committed to working to unify Arizona. In the end, we all want the same thing. We want to feel good and stay healthy. Uh, we want to make a good living and have great opportunities. And everyone wants their children and their grandchildren to have opportunities and learn and achieve and go on to be successful and fulfilled. I really believe that if we work cooperatively, our chances of achieving those things are going to be so much higher. My experience and my practice is working with everyone uh, as a leader who really has everyone's best interest at heart. And I know how to reach win-win solutions. I hope that the voters in 21 will vote for me and only me. And my website is electconnect.org. Thank you. Thank you, Kathy. Finally, we'll hear from Doug Irvin. Well, thank you very much for everybody being here tonight. And I have to admit, I am disappointed that more candidates didn't show up. If you look at their mailers, they'll say education is right at the top of their list. But yet they're not willing to come out and share their views because there is a robust discussion that has to be had as to how are we going to properly fund our schools? What is the best method for those things? So what I've been doing is I've personally knocked 20,000 doors in 2018. I've made thousands of phone calls talking to folks across our district. And what I hear the most is we just want somebody who, people who will listen to us and will work together to solve the problems that we need to do. And that's what I'm there to do. I'll work with anything in a bipartisan manner to get things done so that we're solving the issues for our students. And I'd like to hear from the people in our district. So please reach out to me. My website is irvinforarizona.com, E-R-V-I-N-F-O-R-A-Z.com. And thank you very much for your questions this evening and taking the time to talk about education. Thank you, Doug. And thank all of our candidates who are here tonight. I know we all appreciate your willingness to share your views honestly and directly. And viewers, we also wanna thank you for joining us. A full length video of tonight's forum will be available on our YouTube after the event. Remember to mail back your ballot by October 28th at the latest. 
Voting centers are open for in-person voting as early as October 7th. Look online or post questions in the comments thread if you'd like help finding a location. Again, I'm Julie Erfley, and on behalf of the Arizona Center for Economic Progress and Save Our Schools Arizona Network, thank you for being an informed voter. Good night. Good night. <laughs>